Okay, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to the talk about practical use of drones in everyday life. So please greet our speaker and enjoy the talk. So my name is Nemanja and today I'm going to talk about drones and uh, how we can use them to help us in our everyday life. That, that's the main topic of this talk. Uh, bit about me, uh, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm not a software developer or hardware developer, I'm more from the management side. I finished an MBA course in uh, Great Britain and after that I choose to work in startups, in IT startups, so I, I have already co-founded two startups. One was a great failure. Uh, on the second one, we're working, so it won't be a failure, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, and uh, drones are my hobby. Uh, I like to build things, I like to tinker with uh, various hardwares, uh, so that was something that was really interesting to start doing about three years ago. That's, that's when I started to build drones. Um, and I haven't been that active uh, in the drone thing in the last year or so because I didn't have enough time to, to focus on that, but my idea is to uh, build a startup that will have to do something with drones uh, to utilize them and commercialize in a civilian way. So let's start with the presentation. So first of all, I, I would like to talk about drones versus robots. So what, what is a robot? Robot is something that doesn't need direct human interaction to work. Uh, Tesla uh, was the first one who created something of a, of a robot or a drone and that was a remote controlled ship, a small one, although it was like two meters long. And you can see that chip in uh, his museum in Belgrade. Uh, later on, the official term robot was coined by Karel Čapek in the 1920s. Uh, that's the first time that uh, somebody explained what a robot really is and gave the name of, of that. Uh, later on, Unimate was the first industrial robot and it was built in the United States. It was used as a production robot on an assembly line and I think it was later sold to General Motors or some company like that, or General Electric. Uh, and about flying drones, the next thing is the Ryan Firebee. That, that's uh, probably the first flying drone that really worked. You had like V1 rockets, German rockets, there, there was something of a drone. Sorry? Yeah, but it was a flying robot. It's not an industrial one. So that it's the Ryan Firebee is the first aerial drone, let's say it that way, aerial robot that was really successful. Before that you had, as I said, like V1, V2 rockets and many other rockets that worked to some part, but they didn't have much electronics in them. Ryan Firebee was the first one that had some computer chip in and it worked and it was used for the target practice for the US Air Force and later on they even uh, used it as a spy, spy drone. They made a program for that and it really flew and it took fo footages over China and then it would drop the film and the plane would uh, pick it up mid-air. Uh, after that, Predator is one of the most successful military drones in use today. Uh, it was developed in the 1980s, developed for about 10 years, and we all know what Predator is because we had close encounters with it in the 1990s. Uh, so uh, the main thing about this slide, I wanted to uh, make a difference between what is a robot and what's a drone. A drone is a vehicle that goes through air or water. That's the main definition of a drone. Robot can be anything else. It can be a robot in the factory. It can be, I don't know, cleaning robot or whatever. But 
that's the main difference with, between drones and robots. Drones are usually robots. They usually have some form of intelligence, artificial intelligence, to control themselves. They can be completely unmanned, or they can have a pilot somewhere remotely located to fly them or drive them, but they can also be completely unmanned and autonomous. Uh, so, uh, I would like to talk about the type of drones. So, this is just an introduction for people who don't know what drones are, what robots are, and they're not that used to those terms. Um, so, there are three main types of drones that are used today, mostly in the military, and I'll explain why I focus on military that much later on. Um, so, we have fixed wing, that, those are airplanes, just normal airplanes. There's domestic one, that's Pegas, that's domestic uh, fixed wing drone. Predator, Reaper, Global Hawk, etc. Lots of them. Every military probably in the world has some form of an aerial drone, a fixed fixed wing drone. Uh, then we have rotary wing. Rotary wing is the different name for helicopters. So helicopters are rotary wing. Uh, not too many of drones exist that are rotary wing. They're a bit more complicated to build, so it's a bit harder to make them. And uh, the newest ones are multi-rotor drones, and that's something that we're going to talk today about. And we have uh, the first one, Lockheed Indago, that's the, probably the first uh, professionally built military-grade multi-rotor drone. Uh, after that, Canadian Dragonflyer, uh, it's, it was semi-successful, that, that, like, that was the first cheap probably not that cheap, it cost around 30,000 euros, but it was successful, and the guy sold a lot of them uh, for police forces and military forces in the US. After that, we have DJI 600, those are more hobby, hobby made, uh, and after that, we have like completely homemade uh, models like MultiV and everything that's based on open source uh, boards like Arduino or Raspberry Pi or stuff like that. So the, the, the most important thing is that there are like three type of drones and we're going to focus on the multi-rotor ones because those two first are not that interesting because they need, uh, they're much more expensive and they need uh, much more knowledge to build. So this is the Ryan Firebee. It had a jet engine uh, even. This is the Predator. And this is, I think, I don't know, MQ-18 or something like that. And it's, it's, it's completely in use by the US Air Force. OK, so uh, the first part of the presentation, I focused mainly on military ones. Uh, now I'm going to talk about military versus civilian ones. The reason why I focused on military drones, because they completely dominated the airspace. You didn't have any civilian drones five or ten years ago, ten years ago, maybe five years there was, but like ten years ago you had none. Uh, the reason for that is that uh, the technology was very expensive to build drones. You need to have extreme knowledge of a lot of things. Uh, microprocessors were very expensive, sensors were very complicated and very expensive and mostly large. Uh, so when they start making these things, like they have accelerometers, barometers, or whatever inside of it, and it's very cheap. I mean, this phone costs 400 euros, so the electronics are very cheap inside of that. Uh, so people started thinking, okay, how can we use those electronics to build something that can fly? That's the main thing. Uh, yeah, as I said, like expensive, complicated technology were to blame that there, there were no civilian drones 10 years ago. Uh, so, uh, 10 years ago, uh, we had an introduction to Arduino. Arduino is a very simple microcontroller that you can build mostly anything on it. So, people started thinking, okay, how can we grab some sensors or accelerometers from, from other devices and connect them to Arduino and use that to power an airplane or a multi-rotor? Um, and geeks did that. They took, uh, they took the controller from Nintendo Wii, 
nunchucks because it had very sensitive accel accelerometers and gyroscopes. And they took that apart and took those chips and put them on an Arduino board and made a firmware that will use those data to uh, stabilize the craft. The main thing was how can we stabilize the craft to, to be to hover or to fly where we want wanted to fly, and that's how they did it. So, uh, as I already said, in this lecture I'm going to talk about multi rotors. Uh, I honestly believe that multi rotors is the way to go, uh, and I'll explain you why I think so. First of all, um, they're very affordable. I mean, you can build one for less than 1,000 euros. And a good one you can build for less than 1,000 euros. You can buy one for like 700, 600, I don't know. DJI Phantom costs something around that, and it's completely usable. You can use it for much more than aerial filming or aerial videography. You can use it, I don't know, to take something from this place to different place that's like five minutes away. You can, you can transport like box of, I don't know, cigarettes or, or medicine that distance very easily with that. So that, that's something that's very re revolutionary in that, that you can do that under 1,000 euros. Um, they're very simple to operate. Multi-rotors don't have many moving parts. They have like, the only moving part they have is the motors. And that's, that's something very, very different to an airplane that has a lot of moving parts that have ailerons, flaps, rudders, stuff that can, cannot work. So this is very, very simple, a very low maintenance. You don't need to change parts. You don't need to put oil into it. You don't need to put gasoline into it. So they're very small. They can be, as I don't know how many of you saw those small ones on the desk there, they're like this. And they can be big as much as you want. Um, and yeah, multi-rotor means multi-purpose because you can use it for like tons of different things, from videography, as I already said, to transportation, to whatever you want. We're going to talk about that later. Uh, so um, I'm going to go through briefly through the technical part. I don't know how many of you know how drones work, I mean, the main parts they have and stuff like that. I would like to go just sh very quickly through that. Um, so drones, like multi-rotor drones, have very few uh, elements. And this is probably the, the main list of elements. Uh, they have motors. They have flight control board. That's the brain of the whole craft. They have motor controllers. They have batteries. And they have propellers. They have also a frame, but that's something I didn't put in there. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, so, flight control board. That's the main main board that controls how the craft operates, how it behaves in the air, and how it flies. Uh, it takes the signals from sensors from, and from your input, if you have an input, or if it has some GPS coordinates. They, the brain takes those coordinates and says, OK, I need to fly there, I need to fly there, I need to fly there, and calculates the path to do that. Uh, so we can have various input sources from the radio that you control, to GPS, barometers, altimeters, accelerometers, whatever. It's, uh, that, that tells us where the craft is and how it should behave. Uh, th usually, nowadays, they're based on ARM. 32-bit chips because they're very affordable, they're cheap, and they don't take too much uh, power to to use. So that that's a good thing. Uh, before before those type of chips, it was very complicated to put a microchip in, into the drone because it will consume too much energy, and you need every bit of power to power the drone. Uh, so this thing changed a bit. Uh, on the upper right side, uh, that's DJI NASA. That's probably the most popular uh, flight control board. And it's completely uh, a closed system. You buy it, it and it's completely plug, plug and play. You plug the motors, you plug the batteries, you plug the radio, and it works. And it works fantastically. It's stable, it flies, 
that's a good thing. Uh, under that, you can see an Arduino board. It's a mega board. You can use that to build, no problem. There's open source firmware you can download and upload to your Arduino board, and it will work. It, it will need much more tinkering, so it can fly as you want, but it could work. That's probably the cheapest way to, to build a drone, but the most time-consuming, because you'll lose probably a few weeks to calibrate everything so it works. Uh, okay, so batteries. Uh, most drones that you can build use lithium polymer batteries. Uh, they're very reliable. They're also cheap. Uh, and you can buy them anywhere. And they can uh, sustain very high loads. You can, um, that's a very important thing because traditional batteries cannot sustain those big loads when you put on them. And these batteries can. can. Um, and also, batteries are the bottleneck for further uh, drone development because uh, the only thing that's really limiting dr dr drones in that way, multi-rotors nowadays, are flight times. The flight times are, are not more than 20 or 30 minutes usually, and that's a big problem. I mean, if you want to transport something from Belgrade to Novi Sad, you need probably more than 30 minutes of flight time, and th that's the main bottleneck. You, they need to find a way to make batteries last long or use some other type of technology to provide energy for the drones. Um, yeah, as I say, said, flight times went OK. Uh, motors, motors are very simple. That th they are the only moving part. And inside of them, there's like only ball bearings. So there's nothing to break, really, inside of them. Uh, they're brushless, thanks to Tesla. I mean, that we have those. Um, they have very high RPMs. The propellers around 2,000, 3,000 RPMs on, on my drone, for example. Um, and I said they're, they're really cheap. I mean, one motor costs $15, 20 you can, you, can, you can use that to build a drone, so you need 80, 80 bucks to make a quadcopter. Uh, and then we have electronic speed control. That's that's uh, the middleman between the control uh, between the control flight control board and the motors. Uh, it's it's a very important part of the whole uh, multi rotor craft because it tells the motors how how quickly they should spin, and if they sh if they should slow down or speed up, and it depends on the position of the craft or if you want to go uh, forward, then then some motors need to slow down and some need to speed up so that the craft will move in that direction. So they're very important, and they also uh, act as a transformer because we have batteries that are DC, and we need to transform that uh, electricity to AC, so the motors will spin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, every every motor needs needs to have a separate electronic speed control because that part tells that motor how quickly they, it should spin. So if you have four motors, you, ha you need to have four ESCs. Uh, and there's also some specialized for multi-rotors. That's Simon K. If anyone has a drone, install it. You can flash the firmware on that. because It's also based on an ARM chip. And you can flash on Simon K. And it really makes a difference in, in flight because it updates. Uh, the ref refresh rate is much higher. And that's needed for 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 stability. Usually, those ESCs are are used in RC planes, so they don't need to uh, have that good refresh rate to change speed because the plane just flies and it doesn't have to be slower or quicker, like 400 times a second. And Simon K is made to to have a refresh rate of 400 hertz, so that's 400 times a second. It changes the speed of the engines of the motor. OK. Uh, so a little bit about mechanics, uh, three axis, pitch, yaw, and roll. Uh, and you can see. And as I already said, movement is adjusted by changing the RPMs, the speed of the rotation of the motors. So if you want to move forward, you need to slow down the forward motors and speed up the back ones so it will tilt. 
And the same thing if you want to move up or down, you need to slow down all of them, speed up all of them, or rotation. Rotation is a bit interesting because you slow down uh, counter motors so that the torque of, because they spin in opposite directions, so when you slow down two opposite ones, you have higher torque on one or, or the other side, so it, it moves by torque. Okay? Okay, so now we come to the main part of this lecture. Uh, here, uh, I, I would like that you uh, ask questions, tell your ideas or whatever. Uh, that's how I imagine this, this lecture. I don't want to talk all the time. I want to hear your ideas. Uh, so, uh, I'll, what do you think um, is the main use of civilian drones nowadays? Like, does anyone have an idea? Yeah. I think 90% of drones that are sold today uh, by DJI or any other brand are used for fun or for aerial photography. And th that's like, that's the main commercial part of drones in 2015. DJI sell, sells drones for, for photography and that's it. They don't do anything else than that. Or for hobby. For playing outside. I mean, if you're a kid and you have like 15 years, it would be very cool to have a drone and fly it in the backyard and that's okay. But that's not the real commercial value of, of multi-rotor drones. Um, I really believe that <laughs> that's not the main value and it shouldn't be to, to play with it or to film something, to film w weddings or whatever. I mean, that's, that's, that's a cool thing. I, th I think that's good. I mean, I saw, I saw a few races and that, that's very interesting. I don't know how they fly like, like that, but it's cool. Okay, so this, I think, uh, has the highest value for commercialization in the drone industry, and that's transportation. Uh, very big companies like DHL or Am and Amazon are very interested in that, and they invest a lot of money uh, to, to make drones that can be used for transportation. They don't invest a lot of money in the technology. They invest a lot of money in laws. They want to change the laws so that the law will allow them to have transportation drones. Uh, last year I was um, on the Web Summit in Dublin and I met a guy who has a very successful company building drones and he is uh, part of uh, a group and that consists of Google, uh, DHL, Amazon, and I don't know who, who else, that's lobbying in the US Senate to change the laws about the drone industry. So, so it's a very, very big thing. They invest a lot of money. They have uh, very influential people in the US Senate that, 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 that is trying to change that and to allow them to completely freely use drones for transportation. So, that's one, probably one of the biggest thing that, that's going to happen in the next few years that we'll see uh, transportation drones everywhere around us. M probably not here, but in the US it will be like that. Uh, the next thing that, that's very interesting for me uh, is search and rescue drones. Uh, I, I haven't heard about a successful operation about search and rescue that, that used drones. I don't know if any one of you heard, but we had... Yeah, yeah but I think that our GSS also has that they bought, but I don't think they use it. You had like a situation last year, uh, f flooding, floods in Obrenova, they didn't use it. I know a guy who went with the drone there and he told the commander, okay, I can make uh, complete footage of the whole area, just let me get through the, the, the roadblocks. And they said, no, we don't need that. So, um, 
and they, they did need it. I mean, it, it's very needed. It's quick, it's cheap, it doesn't cost anything. It costs a battery that you can recharge, so it doesn't cost anything. Um, they don't use it. Okay, but uh, you can save lives. So it doesn't really, it's not that important. It's, it doesn't cost a million dollars. It costs 500 euros. That's nothing. It's not a present. I mean, that, that's, my phone costs more than that. So that, that's nothing. And, uh, but they don't use it. I don't know why. Um, probably there's um, no one came to them with the idea of using it. They probably saw it on the internet. Hey, this, this, this would be cool. And they buy one and no one, no one flies flies it and no one knows how to fly it and no one knows how to deploy it quickly and that's also a very important thing about commercialization of multi-rotor aircraft I believe that there's a good chance to to build build drones that can be used by uh, firemen by policemen by GSS GSS I don't know how to translate it mountain rescue service yep uh, they're very uh, into search and rescue missions because they're probably the, the most ready uh, structure of the whole emergency teams that for those kind of situations. Um, so I, I believe that you can create a startup, you can create, a, you can develop a drone that could be used in those type of uh, situations, especially if it's linked to a cloud server or whatever and that all the necessary teams that need to see uh, can see in real time what's happening so firemen ambulances police whoever needs to see can log in and see real time what's happening and that's something that 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 people should think about um, third many drones uh, this, this is very interesting because a friend of mine, he studies, uh, he's on a PhD course uh, in two Delft, that's uh, University, Technical University Delft in uh, Holland, in Netherlands, and they build uh, a Medi drone. They just, it's just a concept, they build something like in two weeks, um, and it, it has uh, heart paddles, defibrillator inside of it. So if somebody has a heart attack, they can fly it and you can re re revive that person with that drone. Uh, it's just a concept. They don't know it will, if that will work on, in large scales, but still. Um, second, uh, I saw a concept of a drone. It's bigger. It's like not a small drone. It's much larger, but it's used to transport uh, patients. You can put one stretch and one patient in it, and it can fly very quickly to the, the, the hospital. And it's completely unmanned. So if there's a traffic accident, you can put that person in that drone and fly to the hospital in no time. So that's also something that utilization should think about when talking about drones. Uh, mapping and uh, geographic information system, that's also a very interesting thing. It's already used in that industry not that much because uh, in some ways uh, fixed wing drones are much easier to use in that because you need long flight times but still some some companies use it use multi-rotor drones for mapping and for uh, it's it's very quick to deploy if you need to see something so so why not and you can mount I don't know ultra red or whatever infrared uh, sensors on it and you can see a lot of things about the ground that you're scanning you can yeah you can you need yeah you need clear space even if it's bigger you need a runway or whatever so it's much more uh, much more complicated to deploy you can put this yeah exactly you can put this in the back of the truck and you just take it out and it will fly. Uh, this damage control is something that's very connected to search and rescue. Um, I don't know why I put it. In my head, it's a bit different because damage control is more about 
um, filming or uh, scanning some some I don't know building after a fire to see how damaged it is. I mean, you can you can scan the roof. You can see that's something that you will need probably three or four men and a fire fireman truck to get up on the roof and see how damaged this. You can do do that in like five minutes time with a drone that costs 500 euros. Just put it in the air, make a video of it, take footage, and you can you can you can see what what happened. So that's something about damage control. Could be connected with search and rescue, and but it doesn't have to be. Um, and the last one is videography. Uh, that's the main use of drones today. I didn't want to talk about that too much because probably everyone was on a wedding where the photographer had a drone or you saw drones on the beer fest in Belgrade or whatever. So, so people use that mainly for that. Uh, so, okay, uh, this is just a image, random image from the internet where KFC uses a drone to transport whatever. That's just a joke. But this one is not a joke. This is Amazon Prime Air, and uh, it's very good. I mean, it, they built it very simply. It's very cheap to build, and it carries a box full of books that will land in front of your house when you order them. It's a good idea. And this is the concept of that uh, Medi drone. So uh, it's a bit larger. The motors fold up and you put the stretch and the person in there and it closes and the motors come down and it will fly to the nearest hospital so that's the idea of that okay um i would like to talk about market size because i'm from the startup uh, ecosystem and it's very important for me to um to to see that people have good ideas to, uh, I, I want to spread that ecosystem, especially in Serbia, where we're a very small ecosystem. There's not too much startups. And uh, I want to tell you that there's very good opportunities for drones. You can create a startup, have a good idea, and you could probably uh, be part of that large uh, market. DJI, for example, who is the biggest drone company today was just a um, start, uh, university startup seven years ago, six years ago. Like three students from some Chinese university tried to build something and they built it. They're very big. They're worth, you'll see the graph. And so in 2015, the whole ma market for civilian drones, I'm not talking about military drones because that's something completely different, uh, is $6 billion of that. I guess that 90% is DJI. Maybe not 90, but 80% for sure is DJI. And they sell drones for hobby, for videography, whatever. Plug and play drones. And they do it good. People really buy their drones. So, uh, and they're nothing special. Their drones are, are, I don't know, toys, honestly. But they do fly, and they do fly good. I see boys that, <laughs> yeah. He has a DJI, and I also use DJI flight controls, so uh, they're good, but they're toys. You can build something much more better than that, surely. Um, so here's the graph. This is from Business Intelligence. I don't think this is actually a completely true graph, because, but you, you can see some uh, ratio. This is military drones, and this is civilian drones. So military drones are definitely the largest part of the market and that's something that it's not easy to tap into because you need to have contracts with the military forces to to create something specially for them and to sell them and it's very complicated complicated to get into that business but civilian drones are something completely different the, uh, people can still make a startup make a drone and sell it to the public or to the firefighters or to the police and earn money from that and make a good living. Okay, uh, probably the, the last part of all of this is that I already said that the, the typical drone is cheaper than an iPhone and everyone has an iPhone so everyone can have a drone and that means that you can tomorrow that you can have like 
million drones in Serbia, and that could be a very problematic thing. I mean, if you have a million drones in Serbia, you probably will have 500,000 dead people tomorrow because people buy those and they don't know how to fly it and they will crash it into the first car or person or whatever. Uh, so there needs to be some form of uh, legislation, a law, that will um, control all of that. And um, my opinion is that it's very important to have a good, good legislation and good control over those types of crafts because they're not toys. Even that I, I said they're toys, they're not toys. They're like flying uh, two kilo stones. I mean, if you don't know how to fly them, th they're stone that has two kilos. And if you crash that into whatever, it will ma make damage, serious damage. So uh, not everyone should have a drone. That, that's like definitely. Uh, I wouldn't let most of the people in Serbia operate drones that do operate, I, I wouldn't let them because they're completely um, not conscious of where they're flying, how they're flying and how much damage that type of flying can, can make to other people. Uh, so more and more countries are into introducing some form of uh, drone laws. Uh, the US probably is the first one who did it and they're also the most restrictive because it's very hard to legally own a drone and operate a drone in the US. Uh, it ranks the same as flying a sport airplane. You need to have the same type of license to, to fly a drone as you would to fly an airplane. That's from, from some point that's a good thing. The other, the other point is that it's not a good thing. I mean that's very expensive. And if I buy a drone that costs 1,000 euros, why would I need to pay 10,000 to have a license for that? So that's, but still, you, you need to know the laws that, that, that are used in the air, aerospace industry, that, that are used by airplane pilots. You need to know that. You need to know some general laws of physics that are concerned with, uh, with flying. And that's a very important thing, but still. Uh, Serbia is also introducing a law in a month time. Uh, it's not that restrictive. You need to pass some tests so they can see that you're at least mentally normal to operate something that can potentially be deadly. Uh, so that's a good thing, by my opinion. I didn't read the law completely in detail, but I saw the bullets about it and it's okay. it sounds okay. Uh, some forms of control are necessary. The main problem is that you cannot actually control uh, drones except who's buying it and does, does the person that's buying it have any type of license for that? Because you cannot see them on the radar. They're too small uh, to, see, to be seen on the radar. Uh, you cannot track them that easily. Uh, they use frequencies that are op open to the general public. Most of them use 2.4 gigahertz. That's the same frequency as wireless. Uh, so some forms of control are very necessary. I stress that, 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 that people who have drones should take really good care of how they operate them because it's a, it could be a deadly weapon. Um, and yeah, coming to that, there's potential problems and dangers. Thankfully, uh, there wasn't too many cases of some globally, uh, on the global scale, some serious damage with drones. We're talking about civilians, we're not talking about kill drones that are military, that do make a lot of dan uh, damage and kill a lot of people yearly. And most of people agree that that's completely unethical to have a pilot sitting 10,000 kilometers in a box in Nevada and killing other people in Afghanistan through a joystick and a screen. Um, so we're talking about civilian drones. We didn't have like three days, four days ago, we had like a drone crash in the US Open, but it didn't hurt anyone. The guy just crashed it on the, 
on the US Open match, but still. Um, we had a uh, situation in Serbia in the beginning of the year where uh, there was a football match between Serbia and Albania, and the Albanians uh, brought uh, a DJI Phantom with the flag of the big Albania, or whatever it's called. Um, and that's, you, could not, you couldn't control that. You couldn't do anything about it because you cannot shoot the drone. It's very hard to hit the drone because you, ha you need to hit the propeller or motor so it will go down. So you could just sit and watch what's happening. And thanks to Stefan Mitrovic, he took the flag down. But still, I mean, if you didn't do that, you, you wouldn't be able to do anything. You would just sit and watch. So um, that's a big problem that you cannot control it. You can just try to control who, who owns it and how, it, how he will operate it, educate him, but that's the only thing. Uh, and this is, this is something that will probably get me on a, some form of blacklist, terrorist watch or whatever. You could put two kilo bomb onto a drone. You could put two kilos of C4. Two kilos of C4 is the equivalent of a normal camera that you put on DJI Phantom, and that is equ equivalent, I don't know, to how much kilos of TNT, probably 200 kilos of TNT. It could tear this whole place down in an instant. And you could put that easily on a drone and fly it five kilometers away from you and just shoot it into a house or a building or a parliament or whatever. And that's, that's the main thing. Thank, thanks to God, it didn't happen yet. But I honestly believe it will happen very soon because terrorists also know how to use the internet and they know how to buy things online and like put those things together. You have like very cheap, very effective killing machine. Uh, and probably uh, because Balkan is a lot about privacy, uh, important thing about drones, they can be used to uh, gather illegal surveillance info about any one of us. You couldn't, I mean, probably there's some very silent ones. I haven't seen silent drones, but probably the, the military has some that could probably fly to your window and stay there like for five minutes and film what you're doing inside, probably, and you wouldn't be able to notice it. You wouldn't be able to hear it. So, uh, so they could be used to gather uh, surveillance. Uh, that's something that should also be controlled, but again, anyone can do that illegally. So that, that's something that, that people should also think about when thinking about drones, is that every time you fly, you probably, on the GoPro camera that you have, you probably film something that somebody will mind you having it. So. That, that's something that, that you should also think about. Um, that's about privacy. So if there's a million drones, because millions million people can buy them tomorrow, we don't have any privacy at all from the air. We don't have any privacy anyway, but still, you should try to keep that kind of privacy as much as we can. Um, and that will be it from, from my side. So I would like to see if anyone has questions, I guess, there's some people do, that do have questions, so. Um, unfortunately not. There's drones on the desk outside, but the batteries are not charged. I don't know if Boris, yeah, he could probably, maybe he could bring the small ones here. Yeah, why not? Yeah, we have some small ones that, that we can fly inside. If the batteries are charged, then why not? Any other question until we wait for the arrival of the drones? No questions? Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, well, if you educate them better, then they probably will fly it into the field. 
Yes, she is a small one, and this one costs around 40, 50 euros, 40 euros. I don't know. Yeah, you 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 can fly it. You're better in that. And this one is very safe because it's light and the propellers are not that hard and if, even if they hit you, it wouldn't hurt that much. Yeah. <laughs> we, we didn't practice for this, so we probably will need a more, bit more training. That will be for that. Thank you. And uh, here's my contact email. You can find me on LinkedIn or you can find me on Twitter or whatever. And if anyone has any um, questions that they didn't think about now or any ideas of how uh, some, something that I can help you or you can help me, please contact me. Please feel free to contact me. No more questions?